Friedrich Nietzsche. The World's Wrongs I hope no one minds if we dispense with this for now. Also tossed his circlet down, gold twinkling in a dusty shaft of spring sunlight as it spun around and around. Damn thing chafes, rather. He rubbed at the sore spots it had left above his temples. There was a metaphor there somewhere. The burden of power, the weight of a crown. But his closed counsel had no doubt heard all that before. The moment he sat, they began to drag out their own chairs, wincing as old backs bent, grunting as old asses settled on hard wood, grumbling as old knees were eased under the tottering heaps of paper on the table. "'Where's the surveyor-general?' someone asked, nodding at an empty chair. "'Out with his bladder!' there was a chorus of groans. "'One can win a thousand battles!' Lord Marshal Brint worried at that lady's ring on his little finger, gazing into the middle distance as though at an opposing army. But in the end, no man can defeat his own bladder. As the youngest in the room by some thirty years also ranked his bladder among his least interesting organs. One issue before we begin, he said. All eyes turned towards him apart from those of Baez down at the foot of the table. The legendary wizard continued to gaze out of the window towards the palace gardens, which were just beginning to bud. "'I am set on making a grand tour of the Union,' also did his best to sound authoritative, regal even. "'To visit every province, every major city,' When was the last time a monarch visited Starakland? Did my father ever go? Archlector Glockter grimaced even more than usual. Starakland was not considered safe, your majesty. Starakland has always been afflicted with a restless temper. Lord Chancellor Gorodetz was absently smoothing his long beard into a point, fluffing it up, then smoothing it again. Now more than ever. But I have to connect with the people, also thumped the table to give it emphasis. They needed some feeling in here. Everything in the white chamber was cold, dry, bloodless calculation. Show them we're all part of the same great endeavour, the same family. It's supposed to be a union, isn't it? We need to bloody unite also had never wanted to be king. He enjoyed it even less than being crown prince, if that was possible. But now that he was king, he was determined to do some good with it. Lord Chamberlain Hoff tapped at the table in limp applause. A wonderful idea, your majesty. Wonderful, echoed High Justice Bruckle, who had the conversational style of a woodpecker and a beak not dissimilar. Idea! Noble sentiments well expressed, agreed Gorodetz, though his appreciation did not quite reach his eyes. One old man fussed with some papers, another frowned into his wine as though something had died in it. Gorodetz was still stroking his beard, but now looked as if he could taste piss. But, also was learning that in the closed council there was always at least one but. But, off glanced to Baez, who gave permission with the slightest nod. It might be best to wait for a more auspicious moment, a more settled time. There are so many challenges here which require your majesty's attention. The High Justice puffed out a heavy breath. Many challenges. Also delivered something between a growl and a sigh. His father had always despised the white chamber and its hard, stark chairs, despised the hard, stark men who sat on them. He had warned also that no good was ever done in the closed council. But if not here, where? This cramped, stuffy, featureless little room was where the power lay. Are you suggesting the machinery of government would grind to a halt without me? he asked. 
I think you over-sugar the pudding. There are issues the monarch must be seen to attend to, said Glockter. The breakers were dealt a crippling blow in Valbeck. A hard task, well done, your majesty, Hoff drooled out with cloying sycophancy. But they are far from eradicated, and those that escaped have become even more extreme in their opinions. Disruption among the workers! High Justice Bruckle rapidly shook his bony head. Strikes, organising, attacks on staff and property. And the damn pamphlets, said Brint to a collective groan. Damn pamphlets! Used to think education was merely wasted on the commoners. Now I say it's a positive danger. This bloody weaver can turn a phrase, not to mention an obscene etching. They incite the populace to disobedience, to disaffection. They talk of a great change coming. A flurry of twitches ran up the left side of Glockter's wasted face. They blame the Open Council, and published caricatures of them as pigs fighting over the trough. They blame the Clothed Council, and published caricatures of them fucking each other. They blame His Majesty, and published caricatures of him fucking anything. They blame the banks. They promote the ridiculous rumour that the debt to the banking house of Valentin Bolk has crippled the state. Gorodets trailed off, leaving the room in nervous silence. Baez finally tore his hard green eyes from the window to glare down the table. This flood of disinformation must be stemmed. We have destroyed a dozen presses, grated Glockter, but they build new ones, and smaller all the time. Now any fool can write and print and air their opinions. Progress, lamented Bruckle, rolling his eyes to the ceiling. The breakers are like bloody moles in a garden growled Lord Marshal Ruxted, who had turned his chair slightly sideways on to give an impression of fearless dash. You kill five, pour a celebratory glass, then in the morning your lawn's covered in new bloody molehills. More irritating than my bladder, said Brint to widespread chuckling. Glockter sucked at his empty gums with a faint squelch. And then there are the burners. Lunatics, snapped Hoff. This woman, judge. Shudders of distaste about the table. At the notion of such a thing as a woman, or at the notion of this particular one, it was hard to say. I hear a mill owner was found murdered on the road to Keln. Corridets gave his beard a particularly violent tug. A pamphlet nailed to his face. Ruxted clasped his big fists on the table. And there was that fellow choked to death with a thousand copies of the rule sheet he distributed to his employees. One might almost say our approach has made matters worse, observed also. A memory of Malma drifted up, legs dangling from his cage as it swung with the breeze. Perhaps we could make some gesture. A minimum wage? Improved working conditions? I heard a recent fire in a mill led to the deaths of fifteen child workers. It would be folly, said Baez, his attention already back on the gardens, to obstruct the free operation of the market. The market serves the interests of all, offered the Lord Chancellor. Unprecedented, agreed the High Justice. Prosperity! No doubt the child workers would applaud it, said Orso. No doubt, agreed Lord Hoff. Had they not been burnt to death? A ladder is of no use if all the rungs are at the top, said Byers. Orso opened his mouth to retort, but High Consul Matstringer got in first. 
and we face a veritable cornucopia of adversaries overseas. The coordinator of the Union's foreign policy had never yet failed to confuse complexity with insight. The Gurkish may still be embroiled in all-encompassing predicaments of their own. Byers gave a rare grunt of satisfaction at that. But the Imperials endlessly rattle their swords on our western border, exhorting the populace of Strarakland to continued disloyalty, and the Styrians are emboldened in the east. They are building up their navy, Lord Admiral Krepskit roused himself for a heavy-lidded interjection. New ships armed with cannon, while ours rot in their docks for lack of investment. Byers gave a familiar grunt of dissatisfaction at that. And they are busy in the shadows, went on Matt Stringer, sowing discord in Westport, enticing the aldermen to sedition. Why, they have succeeded in scheduling a vote within the months which could see the city secede from the Union. The old men competed to display the most patriotic outrage. It was enough to make Orso want to secede from the Union himself. Disloyalty, grumbled the High Justice. Discord. Bloody Styrians, snarled Ruxted. Love to work in the shadows. We can work there too, said Glockter softly, in a manner that made the hairs prickle beneath Orso's braid-heavy uniform. Some of my very best people are even now ensuring Westport's loyalty. At least our northern border is secure, said Orso, desperate to inject some optimism. Well, the High Consul crushed his hopes with a prim pursing of the mouth. The politics of the North are always something of a cauldron. The dogman is advanced in years. Infirm. No man can divine the fate of his protectorate in the event of his death. Lord Governor Brock would appear to have forged a strong bond with the new king of the Norsemen, Stour Nightfall. That has to be a good thing, said Orso. Doubtful glances were traded across the table. Unless their bond becomes too strong, murmured Glockter. The young Lord Governor is popular agreed Gorodets. Damned, pecked the High Justice. Popular. Handsome lad, said Brint, and he's earned a warrior's reputation. England behind him, Stour as an ally, could be a threat. Ruxted raised his bushy brows very high. His grandfather, lest we forget, was an infamous bloody traitor. I will not see a man condemned for the actions of his grandfather, snapped Orso whose own grandfathers had enjoyed mixed reputations, to say the least. Leo Danbrock risked his life fighting a duel on my behalf. The job of your clothed counsel, said Glockter, is to anticipate threats to your majesty before they become threats. After maybe too late, threw in Byers. People are... Discomforted by the death of your father, said Gorodets. So young, so unexpected. Young, unexpected. And you, your majesty, are despised, offered also. Gorodets gave an indulgent smile. Untwied. At times like this, people yearn for stability. Indeed, it would without doubt be a very fine thing if your majesty were— Lord Hoff cleared his throat. <coughs> to marry? Also closed his eyes and pressed finger and thumb against them. Must we? Marriage was the last thing he wanted to discuss. He still had Savine's note in a drawer beside his bed, still looked at that brutal little line every evening, as one might pick at a scab. My answer must be no. I would ask you not to contact me again, ever. Hoff cleared his throat once more. A new king always finds himself in an uncertain position. A king with no heir doubly so, said Glockter. 
The absence of clear succession gives a troubling impression of impermanence, observed Matt Stringer. Perhaps with the help of Her Majesty your mother, I might draw up a list of eligible ladies, both at home and abroad. Hoff cleared his throat yet a third time. <coughs> a new list, that is. By all means, growled Orso, pronouncing each word with cutting precision. Then there is Fedor Dan Wetterland, murmured the High Justice. Glockter's permanent grimace became even further contorted. I hoped we might settle that matter without bothering His Majesty. I'm bothered now, snapped Orso. Fedor Dan Wetterland. Didn't I play cards with him once? He lived in Adua before inheriting the family estate. His reputation here was almost as bad as mine. Orso remembered the man. Soft face, but hard eyes, smiled too much, just like Lord Hoff, who was even now breaking out a particularly unctuous example. I was going to say, abominable, your majesty, he stands accused of serious crimes. He raped a laundry woman, said Glockter, with the assistance of his groundskeeper. When her husband demanded justice, Wetterlant murdered the man again with the groundskeeper's assistance, in a tavern in full view of seventeen witnesses. The emotionless quality of the arch-lector's grating voice only served to sicken or so even more. Then he had a drink. The groundskeeper poured, I believe. Bloody hell, whispered Orso. Those are the accusations, said Matt Stringer. Even Wetterland scarcely disputes them, said Glockter. His mother does, observed Gorodetz. There was a chorus of groans. Lady Wetterland, by the fates, what a battle-axe! Absolute harridan! Well, I'm no admirer of hangings, said Orso, but I've seen men hanged for far less. The groundskeeper already has been, said Glockter. Shame, grunted Brint with heavy irony. He sounded like a real charmer. But Wetterland has asked for the king's justice, said Bruckle. His mother has demanded it. And since he has a seat on the open council, not that his arse has ever touched it, he has the right to be tried before his peers, with your majesty as the judge. We cannot refuse. But we can delay, said Glockter. The open council may not excel at much, but in delay it leads the world. Postpone, differ, adjourn. I can wrap him up in form and procedure until he dies in prison. And the High Justice smiled as though that was the ideal solution. We just deny him a hearing? Also was almost as disgusted by that option as by the crime itself. Of course not, said Bruckle. No, no, said Gorodetz. We would not deny him anything. We'd simply never give him anything, said Glockter. Ruxted nodded. I hardly think Fedor Dan Bloody Wetterland or his bloody mother should be allowed to hold a dagger to the throat of the state simply because he can't control himself. He could at least lose control of himself in the absence of seventeen witnesses, observed Gorodetz, and there was some light laughter. So it's not the rape or the murder we object to, asked Orso, but his being caught doing it? Hoff peered at the other councillors as though wondering whether anyone might disagree. Well... Why should I not just hear the case and judge it on its merits and settle it one way or another? Glockter's grimace twisted still further. Your Majesty cannot judge the case without being seen to take sides. The old men nodded, grunted, shifted unhappily in their uncomfortable chairs. Find Wetterland innocent, it will be nepotism and favouritism and will strengthen the hand of those traitors, like the breakers, 
who would turn the common folk against you. But find Wetterland guilty, Gorodets tugged unhappily at his beard, and the old men grumbled more dismay. The nobles would see it as an affront, as an attack, as a betrayal. It would embolden those who oppose you in the open council at a time when we are trying to ensure a smooth succession. It seems sometimes, snapped also, rubbing at those sore spots above his temples, that every decision I make in this chamber is between two equally bad outcomes, with the best option to make no decision at all. Hoff glanced about the table again. Well, it is always a bad idea, said the first of the Magi, for a king to choose sides. Everyone nodded as though they had been treated to the most profound statement of all time. It was a wonder they did not rise and give a standing ovation. Orso was left in no doubt at which end of the table the power in the white chamber truly lay. He remembered the look on his father's face as Baez spoke, the fear. He made one more effort to claw his way towards his best guess at the right thing. Justice should be done, shouldn't it? Justice must be seen to be done, surely. Otherwise, well, it's not justice at all, is it? High Justice Bruckle bared his teeth as if in physical pain. At this level, Your Majesty, such concepts become fluid. Justice cannot be stiff like iron, but more of a jelly. It must mould itself. About the greater concerns. But surely at this level, at the highest level, is where justice must be at its most firm. There must be a moral bedrock. It cannot all be expediency. Exasperated, Hoff looked towards the foot of the table. Lord Baez, perhaps you might— The first of the Magi gave a weary sigh as he sat forward, hands clasped, regarding Orso from beneath heavy lids. The sigh of a veteran schoolmaster called on once again to explain the basics to this year's harvest of dunces. Your Majesty— we are not here to set right all the world's wrongs. Orso stared back at him. What are we here for, then? Baez neither smiled nor frowned. To ensure that we benefit from them. A Long Way From Adua Superior Lawson lowered the letter, frowning at Vic over the rims of his eye lenses. He looked like a man who had not smiled in some time, perhaps ever. His eminence, the arch-lector, writes you a glowing report. He tells me you were instrumental in ending the uprising at Falbeck. He feels I might need your help. Lawson turned his frown on Tallow, standing awkwardly in the corner, as if the idea of his being helpful with anything was an affront to reason. Vic still wasn't sure why she'd brought him, perhaps because she had no one else to bring. Not need my help, Superior, she said. No bear, badger, or wasp was more territorial than a superior of the Inquisition, after all. But I don't have to tell you how damaging it would be financially, politically, diplomatically, if Westport voted to leave the Union. No, said Lawson crisply. You do not. As superior of Westport, he'd be looking for a job. Which is why his eminence felt you could perhaps use my help. Lawson set down the letter, adjusted its position on his desk, and stood. Forgive me if I am dubious, Inquisitor, but performing surgery upon the politics of one of the world's greatest cities is not quite the same as smashing up a strike. And he opened the door onto the high gallery. The threats are worse and the bribes better, said Vic as she followed him through, Tallow shuffling behind. But otherwise, I imagine there are similarities. Then may I present to you our unruly workers, the Aldermen of Westport. And Lawson stepped to the balustrade and gestured down below. 
There, on the floor of Westport's cavernous Hall of Assembly, tiled with semi-precious stones in geometric patterns, the leadership of the city was debating the great question of leaving the Union. Some aldermen stood, shaking fists or brandishing papers. Others sat, glumly watching or with heads in hands. Others bellowed over each other in at least five languages, the ringing echoes making it impossible to tell who was speaking, let alone what was being said. Others murmured to colleagues or yawned, scratched, stretched, gazed into space. A group of five or six had paused for tea in a distant corner, men of every shape, size, colour and culture a cross-section through the madly diverse population of the city they called the crossroads of the world, wedged onto a narrow scrap of thirsty land between Styria and the south, between the Union and the Thousand Isles. Two hundred and thirteen of them at the current count, and each with a vote. Lawson pronounced the word with evident distaste. When it comes to arguing, the citizens of Westport are celebrated throughout the world, and this is where their most dauntless arguers stage their most intractable arguments. The superior peered towards a great cloak on the far side of the gallery. They've been at it for seven hours already today. Vic was not surprised. There was a stickiness to the air from all the breath they'd wasted. The fates knew she was finding Westport more than hot enough, even in spring, but she had been told that in summer, after particularly intense sessions, it could sometimes rain inside the dome, a sort of spitty, drizzling back of all their high-blown language onto the furious alderman below. Seems the opinions are somewhat entrenched down there. I wish they were more so, said Lawson. Thirty years ago, after we beat the Gurkish, you couldn't have found five votes for leaving the Union. But the Styrian faction has gained a great deal of ground lately. The wars, the debts, the uprising in Valbeck, the death of King Jazal, and his son is, shall we say, not yet taken seriously on the international stage. Without mincing words, our prestige is in the nightpot, Vic finished for him. We joined the Union because of their military might. A truly mighty voice boomed out, finally cutting through the hubbub. The speaker was thick-set, dark-skinned and shaven-headed with strangely gentle gestures. Because the empire of Gurkal threatened us from the south, and we needed strong allies to deter them. But membership has cost us dear. Millions of scales in treasure, and the price forever rises. Agreement floated up to the gallery in an echoing murmur. Who's the man with all the voice? asked Vic. Solomeo Shudra, said Lawson sourly, the leader of the pro-Styrian faction and a royal thorn in my arse, half Siponese, half Kadiri, a fitting emblem for this cultural melting pot. Vic knew all this, of course. She made a great deal of effort to go into every job well informed, but she preferred to keep her knowledge to herself whenever possible and let others imagine themselves the great experts. During the forty years since we joined the Union, the world has changed beyond all recognition, bellowed Shudra. The Empire of Gurkal has crumbled while Styria has turned from a patchwork of feuding city-states into one strong nation under one strong king. They have defeated the Union in not one, not two, but three wars. Wars waged for the vanity and ambitions of Queen Therese. Wars we were dragged into at vast expense in silver and blood. He talks well, said Tallow softly. Very well, said Vic. He almost has me wanting to join Styria. The Union is a waning power, boomed Shudra, while Styria is our natural ally. The hand of the Grand Duchess Monscaro Macato is extended to us in friendship. We should seize it while we still can. My friends, 
I urge you all to vote with me to leave the Union. Loud boos, but even louder cheers. Lawson shook his head in disgust. If this were Adua, we could march in there, drag him from his seat, force a confession, and ship him off to Angland on the next tide. But we're a long way from Edua, murmured Vic. Both sides worry that an open display of force might turn the majority against them, but things will change as we move towards the vote. The positions are hardening, the middle ground is shrinking. Makato's Minister of Whispers, Shiloh Vitari, is mounting an all-encompassing campaign of bribery and threats, blackmail and coercion, while printed sheets are flung from the rooftops and painted slogans spring up faster than we can scrub them off. I'm told Casimir Danschenkt is in Westport, said Vic, that Makato has paid him one hundred thousand scales to shift the balance by any means necessary. I had heard the rumours. She got the sense that Lawson had heard the same rumours she had, delivered in breathless whispers with a great deal of lurid detail, that Schenk's skills went beyond the mortal and touched the magical, that he was a sorcerer who had damned himself by eating the flesh of men. Here in Westport, where calls to prayer echoed hourly over the city and cut-price profits declaimed on every corner, such ideas were somehow harder to dismiss. Might I lend you a few practicals? Lawson peered at Tallow. To be fair, the lad didn't look as if he could stand up to a stiff breeze, let alone a flesh-eating magician. If Styria's most famous assassin is really on the prowl, we need you well protected. An armed escort would send the wrong message, and would do no good anyway, if those rumours really were true. I was sent to persuade, not intimidate. Lawson was less than convinced. Really? That's how it has to look. Little would look worse than the untimely death of his eminence's representative. I don't intend to rush at the grave, believe me. Few do. The grave swallows us all regardless. What are your plans, Superior? Lawson took a weary breath. I have my hands full protecting our own alderman. The ballots are cast in nineteen days, and we cannot afford to lose a single vote. Taking away some of theirs would help, providing it is done subtly. If their people turn up dead, it is sure to harden feelings against us. Things are finely balanced. Lawson clenched his fists on the railing as Solomeo Shudra boomed out another speech, lauding the benefits of Styria's welcoming embrace. And Shudra has proved persuasive. He is well loved here. I am warning you, Inquisitor. Don't go after him. With all due respect, the Archlector has sent me to do the things you can't. I only take orders from him. Lawson gave her a long, cold stare. Probably it was a look that froze the blood in people used to Westport's warm climate, but Vic had worked down a half-flooded mine in an Angland winter. It took a lot to make her shiver. Then I am asking you. He pronounced each word precisely. Don't go after him. Below them, Shudra had finished his latest thunderous contribution to noisy applause from the men around him and even noisier booing from the other side. Fists were shaken, papers were flung, insults were grumbled. Nineteen more days of this pantomime, with Shiloh Vitari trying everything to twist the outcome. Who knew how that would turn out? His Eminence wants me to keep Westport in the Union. She headed for the door with Tallow at her heels. At any cost. A Sea of Trouble Welcome, one and all, to this fifteenth biannual meeting of Adua's Solar Society. 
Kernsbeck, resplendent in a waistcoat embroidered with silver flowers, held up his broad hands for silence, though the applause was muted. The members used to raise the roof of the theatre. Savine remembered it well. With thanks to our distinguished patrons, the Lady Ardy and her daughter, Lady Savine den Glockta. Kernsbeck gave his usual showman's flourish towards the box where Savine sat, but the clapping now was yet more subdued. Did she even hear a few tattletale whispers below? She's not all she was, you know, not one half of what she was. Ungrateful bastards, she hissed through her fixed smile. Could it only have been a few months since they were soiling their drawers at the mention of her name? To say that it has been a difficult year, Kernsbick frowned down at his notes as though they made sad reading, hardly does justice to the troubles we have faced. You're fucking right there. Savine dipped behind her fan to sniff up a pinch of pearl dust, just to lift her out of the bog, just to keep some wind in the sails. A war in the north, ongoing troubles in Styria and the death of his august majesty, King Giselle I. Too young. Far too young. Kernsbick's voice cracked a little. The great family of our nation has lost its great father. Sabine flinched at the word, had to give her own eye the slightest dab with the tip of her little finger, though no doubt any tears were for her own troubles, rather than a father she had hardly known, and certainly not respected. All tears are for oneself in the end. Then the terrible events in Valbeck. A kind of sorry grumble around the theatre, a stirring below as every head was shaken. Assets ruined, colleagues lost, manufactories that were the wonder of the world left in ruins. Kernsbeck struck his lectern a blow. But already new industry rises from the ashes, modern housing on the ruins of the slums, greater mills with more efficient machinery and more orderly workers. Savine tried not to think of the children in her mill in Valbeck before it was destroyed. The bunk beds wedged in among the machines, the stifling heat, the deafening noise, the choking dust, but so awfully orderly, so terribly efficient. Confidence has been struck, lamented Kernsbeck. Markets are in turmoil, but from chaos opportunity can come. He gave his lectern another blow. Opportunity must be made to come. His august majesty, King Orso, will lead us into a new age. Progress cannot stop, will not be permitted to stop. For the benefit of all, we of the Solar Society will fight tirelessly to drag the Union from the tomb of ignorance and into the sunny uplands of enlightenment. Loud applause this time, and in the audience below, men struggled to their feet. Here, here, someone brayed. Progress, blurted another. As inspiring as any sermon in the great temple of Shaffer, murmured Zuri. If I didn't know better, I'd say Kernsbeck has taken a stiffener himself, said Savine, and she ducked behind her fan and sniffed up another pinch, just one more to get her ready for the fight. Battle was already joined beneath the great chandeliers in the foyer, a sparser melee than at recent meetings, less buoyant, more bitter, hungrier dogs snapping over leaner pickings. The press reminded her of the crowd in Valbeck when the breakers brought food around the slum. They wore silk rather than rags, they stank of perfume rather than stale sweat, the ever-present threat was of ruin rather than violence, but the jostling and the hunger were very much the same. There had been a time when Savine was as comfortable in this crawling activity as a queen bee in her hive. Now her whole body tingled with chilly panic. She had to smother the urge to lash out with her elbows and run screaming for the door. Calm, 
she mouthed to herself, trying to let her shoulders relax so her hands would stop shaking, instantly losing all patience and flexing every muscle instead. Calm, calm, calm. She squeezed her face into a smile, snapped out her fan, and forced herself into the midst of the press, with Zuri at her shoulder. Eyes turned in her direction, expressions harder than she was used to. Assessing, rather than admiring, scornful, rather than envious. They used to crowd around her like pigs around the one trough in the farmyard. Now the most tempting morsels went elsewhere. Sabine could scarcely see Celeste Dan Huygen through the swarm of gentlemen competing for her attention. Only a flash of that garish red wig, a snatch of that hideous, brash, overdone laugh that other women were beginning to imitate. By the fates, I despise that woman, muttered Sabine. The highest compliment you could pay her, said Zuri with a warning glance up from her book. One cannot despise a thing without acknowledging its importance. She was right, as always. Celeste had enjoyed success after success since she invested in that scheme of Caspar Dan Arenholm's, the one that Savine had so pointedly turned down. Her own interests in Angland's mines had taken quite the beating since he began to install his new pumps across the province and those were far from her only disappointing investments of late. Once she made businesses bloom just by smiling at them. Now every apple she bit into turned out rotten. She was not left alone, that was sure, but her fan was busier beckoning the suitors in than waving them off. She was obliged to talk to old Rickard Dan Sleischolt, who had some mad fantasy of making power by damming the white flow. You could tell at a glance he was one of life's losers, the shoulders of his jacket liberally dusted with dandruff, but it was vital that she look busy. While he blathered on, she sifted the flood of conversation around her for opportunities, as a prospector sifts the far country's icy streams for gold. Cutlery and drapery and crockery and clocks, people have money and they want things. Heard Valentin Bulk called in his loans, magnate in the morning, beggar by afternoon, salutary lesson for all of us. Property in Valbeck. You wouldn't believe the price I got on some vacant land. Well, I say vacant, but the scum are easily moved. Impossible to know which way the closed council is going to fall on tax. There's a hell of a hole in the finances. The entire treasury is a hole. Told them if they wouldn't do the work, I'd bring in a crowd of brown bastards who would, and they soon got back to their machines. Nobles, furious. Commoners, furious. Merchants, furious. My wife isn't furious yet, but it never takes much. And so you see, Lady Savine, Slysholt was working up to a grand finale. The power of the white flow is languishing unharnessed, like a stallion unbridled, and, if I may, Kernsbick caught Savine's elbow and steered her nimbly away. Unbridled, Lady Savine, Slysholt called after her. I am available to discuss it further at your convenience. And he dissolved into a coughing fit which faded into the chatter. Thank the fates for you murmured Savine. I thought I'd never escape that old dunce. Kernsbick glanced away while rubbing significantly at his nose. You have a little something just here. Fuck! She dipped behind her fan to wipe a trace of powder from the rim of her sore nostril. When she came up, Kernsbick was looking worriedly at her from under his grey brows, still flecked with a few stubborn ginger hairs. Savine, I count you as one of my closest friends. How lovely of you. I know you have a generous heart. You know more than me, then. And I have the highest regard for your instincts, your tenacity, your wit. It takes no great wit to sense a but coming. I'm worried for you. He lowered his voice. I hear rumors, Savine. I'm concerned about well, about your judgment. 
Her skin was prickling unpleasantly under her dress. My judgment, she whispered, forcing her smile a tooth wider. This venture in Kelm that just collapsed, I warned you it wasn't viable. Vessels that size, you must be delighted at how right you were. What? No, I could scarcely be less so. You must have sunk thousands into financing the Crown Prince's division. It had been closer to millions. Then I hear Court's Canal is hampered by labor problems. Utterly mired in them was closer to it. And it's no secret you lost heavily in Valbeck. You have no fucking idea what I lost in Valbeck. He stepped back, startled, and she realized she had her fist clenched tight around her folded fan and was shaking it in his face. You have no idea. She was shocked to find the pain of tears at the back of her nose, had to snap her fan open again so she could dab at her lids, struggling not to smudge her powder. Never mind her judgment, it was getting to the point where she could hardly trust her own eyes. But when she glanced up, Kernsbick was not even looking at her. He was staring across the busy foyer towards the door. The eager chatter fell silent, the crowd split, and through the midst came a young man with a vast retinue of guards, officers, attendants, and hangers-on, sandy hair carefully arranged to give the impression of not having been arranged at all, white uniform heavy with medals. "'Bloody hell!' whispered Kernsbeck, gripping Savine's elbow. It's the bloody king! Whatever the criticisms, and there were more than ever regularly circulated in pamphlets reveling in the tawdry details, no one could deny that king also looked the part. He reminded Savine of his father. Of their father, she realized, with an ugly twisting of disgust. He chuckled, slapped arms, shook hands, traded jokes, the same beacon of slightly absent good humor King Giselle had once been. "'Your Majesty,' frothed Kernsbeck, "'the Solar Society is illuminated by your presence. I fear we had to begin the addresses without you.' "'Never fear, Master Kernsbeck. also clapped him on the shoulder like an old friend. I can't imagine I would have been much help with the technical details. The great machinist produced the most mechanical of laughs. I am sure you know our sponsor, Lady Savine Dan Glockter. Their eyes met only for an instant, but an instant was enough. She remembered how Orso used to look at her, that mischievous glint in his eye, as if they were players in a delightful game no one else knew about before she learned that they had a father in common, when he was still a crown prince and her judgment was considered unimpeachable. Now his stare was flat and dead and passionless, a mourner at the funeral of someone he had hardly known. He had asked her to marry him, to be his queen, and all she had wanted was to say yes. He had loved her, and she had loved him. Their eyes only met for an instant, but an instant was all she could stand. She sank into the deepest curtsy she could manage, wishing she could keep sinking until the tiled floor swallowed her. Your Majesty! Lady Celeste! she heard also say, his heel clicking sharply as he turned away. Perhaps you might show me around. I'd be honored, Your Majesty and the bubbling of Celeste Dan Huygen's victorious laughter was as painful as boiling water in Savine's ears. It was a slight no one in the entire foyer could have missed. Had also knocked her down and trodden on her throat, he could scarcely have done more damage. Everyone was whispering as she stood, scorned by the king at her own function. She walked to the doors through swimming faces, smile plastered to her burning cheeks, and stumbled down the steps into the twilit street. Her stomach roiled. She pulled at her collar, but she could sooner have torn through a prison wall with her fingernails than loosened that triple stitching. Lady Savine, came Zuri's concerned voice. 
She tottered around the corner of the theatre into the darkness of an alley, doubled up helpless, and sprayed vomit down the wall. Puking made her think of Valbeck. Everything made her think of Valbeck. She straightened, dashing the burning snot from her nose. Even my own stomach is betraying me. A strip of light down the side of Zuri's dark face made one eye gleam. When did your menses last come? she asked softly. Sabine stood for a moment, her breath ragged. Then she gave a hopeless shrug. Just before Leo Dan Brock's visit to Adua. Whoever would have thought I'd miss the monthly agonies. Probably her ragged breath should have turned to choking sobs, and she should have fallen into Zuri's arms and wept at the colossal mess she had made of herself. Kernsbick was right to worry, the old fool. Her judgment had turned to shit, and here was the result. But instead of sobbing, she started to chuckle. I'm puking, she said, in a piss-smelling alley, in a dress that cost five hundred marks, with a bastard on the way. I'm fucking ridiculous. The laughter faded, and she leaned against the wall, scraping her sour tongue clean on her teeth. The higher you climb, the further you have to fall, and the greater the spectacle when you hit the ground. What wonderful drama, eh? And they don't even have to pay for a ticket. She clenched her fists. They all think I'm going down. But if they think I'm going down without a fight, they should— She doubled over and brought up more sick. Just an acrid trickle this time, retching and giggling at once. She spat it out and wiped her face on the back of her glove. Her hand was shaking again. Calm. She muttered at herself, clenching her fists. Calm, you absolute fucker. Siri looked worried, and she never looked worried. I will ask Rabbit to bring the carriage around. We should get you home. Oh, come, come. The night is young. Savine fished out her box for another pinch of pearl dust. Just to get over the humps. Just to keep things moving. She headed for the street. I've a mind to watch Master Broad work. A Routine So, you're happy here, then? Liddy laughed. There'd been weeks when Broad had hardly seen her smile. These days she laughed all the time. Gunner, we lived in a cellar. A stinking cellar, said May, grinning too. It was hard to imagine, with the sunset streaming into their dining room through the three big windows. We ate peelings and drank from puddles, said Liddy, forking another slice of meat onto Broad's plate. We queued to shit in a hole, said May. Liddy winced. Don't say that. I did it, didn't I? Why fuss over saying so? It's the manner of expression I'm objecting to. Liddy was getting to act like a proper lady and enjoying every moment. But yes, we did it. Why wouldn't we be happy now? She pushed across the gravy jug. Broad had never guessed there was such a thing as a special kind of jug for gravy, let alone imagined he might own one. He smiled, too. Made himself smile. Course. Why wouldn't we be happy now? He scooped up a fork full of peas, even managed to get a few in his mouth before they all fell off. You're not much good with a fork, said May. Broad nudged his food around the plate with it. Just holding the damn thing made his hand hurt. Felt too delicate for his aching fingers. You reach an age, it's hard to learn new ways, I reckon. You're too young to be stuck in the past. I don't know. Broad frowned as he prodded at that slice of meat, a little blood seeping. The past has a way of holding on. An awkward pause at that. Tell us you're staying home tonight, said Liddy. Wish I could. Got to head over to the diggings. At this time? Won't take long, I hope. Broad set down his cutlery and stood. Got to make sure the work keeps going. 
Lady Savine can't do without you, eh? May proudly puffed up her chest. Told me she relies on him more and more. Well, tell her she has to share you with your family. Broad snorted as he came around the table. You bloody tell her. Liddy was still smiling as she tipped her face up, lips soft against his. She'd put weight on. They all had, since the lean times in Valbeck. She had that curve to her figure and that glow to her cheek she'd had when they first courted. That same smell she'd had when they first kissed. All that time passed, and he loved her just the same. Worked out all right, she said, fingertips light on his cheek. Didn't it? No thanks to me. He had to talk around a lump in his throat. I'm sorry for all the trouble I brought. That's behind us, said Liddy, firm. We work for a fine lady now. No trouble here. No, said Broad. No trouble. And he trudged towards the door. Don't work too hard, da, called May. When he looked back, she was smiling at him, and that smile caught at something, like there was a hook in his chest, and whatever she did tugged at it. He smiled back, raised an awkward hand in farewell. Then he saw the tattoo on the back and jerked it down, worked it into the cuff of his fine new jacket. He made sure he shut the door firmly behind him. Broad strode through a forest of flaking iron columns across the darkened warehouse floor towards an island of lamplight, footfalls echoing in all that inky emptiness. Halder stood with his arms folded and his face in shadow. He was one of those men who liked his silence. Bannerman leaned against a pillar near him, that cocky tilt to his hips. He was one of those men who always had too much to say. Their guest sat in one of three battered old chairs, hands tied to the back, ankles to the legs. Broad stopped in front of him, frowning down. You're gaunt. I'm gaunt. Didn't try to deny it, at least. Sometimes they did. Broad didn't blame them. Funny name for him, said Bannerman, looking at Gaunt like he was naught but a lump of clay. Cause he's quite sturdy, really. Wouldn't call him fat. But I wouldn't call him gaunt. Have some respect, eh? said Broad as he took his jacket off. We can do this without being disrespectful. What difference does it make? Broad draped the jacket over the back of a chair and stroked the fine cloth flat with the side of his hand. Make some to me. We're not here to make friends. I know why we're here. Broad met Bannerman's eye and held it till he licked his lips and looked away. Then he shifted the chair around so it faced gaunt and sat. He pushed his lenses up his nose, then clasped his hands. He found it helped to have a routine, like when he swept the brewery in Valbeck, just a job to get done like any other. Gaunt watched him all the while, scared eyes, of course, sweat on his forehead, determined, though. Tough man to break, most likely. But anything breaks if you squeeze it hard enough. My name's Broad. He saw Gaunt looking at the tattoo on the back of his hand. He let it hang there. Used to be in the army. We all did, said Bannerman. You know who we work for now? Gaunt swallowed. For court? No. Gaunt swallowed again, harder. For Savine dan Glockter. That's right. We hear you've been organising, Master Gaunt. We hear you've persuaded the workers to down tools. Bannerman made a disapproving tut-tut-tut noise with his tongue. Where things are in the diggings, said Gaunt, the hours they work and the pay they get, they didn't need much persuading. Broad nudged his lenses down to rub at the sore bridge of his nose, then nudged them back up. Look, you seem a decent man, so I'm giving you every chance I can. But Lady Savine wants her canal finished. She's paid for it. And I can tell you for a fact, it's a bad idea to get between her and what she's paid for. A bad idea. 
Gaunt leaned forward, far as he could, tied to the chair. A lad died the other day, crushed by a beam, fourteen years old. He strained around to glance up at Bannerman. You know that? I heard, said Bannerman, and from the way he was looking at his nails hadn't cared a shit. It's a damn shame. Broad snapped his aching fingers to bring Gaunt's eyes back to him. The question is, how's you getting crushed gonna help him? Gaunt stuck his chin up, still defiant. Broad liked him. They could have been on the same side. He supposed they had been not that long ago. I can help the others. The likes of you wouldn't understand. I might surprise you. I was in Valbeck, brother, with the breakers. Fought the good fight there. Thought I did, anyway. Before that, I was in Styria. Thought I fought the good fight there, too. Been fighting good fights all my life. You know what it's got me? Nothing, said Bannerman. Broad frowned up at him. You love to spoil the punchline, don't you? You need some new material. Dare say you're right. Trouble with the good fight, I find. Once the fight starts, the good stops. Broad began rolling up his sleeves while he thought about what to say. Slowly, carefully. Helped to have a routine. He told himself this was for May and for Liddy. Wondered what they'd say if they knew about it and didn't like the answer. That's why they couldn't know. Not ever. I've killed, I think, maybe fifty men, maybe more. Prisoners, some of them. Just following orders. But I did it still. Kept a count at first, and I tried to lose count. But, well, Broad looked down at the little patch of ground between Gaunt's boots. I'll be honest, I was drunk for a lot of it. Drunk as I could get. Bit of a blur. I remember this one fellow in the walls, Styrian, I guess, kept gabbling at me, and I hadn't a clue what he was saying. I threw him off the wall. Wall of Massalia, this was. So, what, thirty strides high? He glanced up at Halder. You were at Massalia, weren't you? Halder nodded. Closer to twenty. High enough, anyway. He hit this cart. Broad stuck his hand into his ribs, trying to show where. And it folded him right in half, sideways. Left him in a shape no living man should ever be. I mean, his feet were pointing backwards. He started making this noise. Broad slowly shook his head. I swear, it was the noise hell makes, and he wouldn't stop. You see some shit out there? Changes the way you look at things. It does, said Halder. Gaunt was staring at him. You think that's something to boast of? Boast of? Broad stared back over the rims of his lenses, so Gaunt was just a sparkly blur in the lamplight. Fuck no. I wake up with the sweats. I cry sometimes. In the quiet times, don't mind admitting it. Me too said Halder. I'm just trying to get you to see. And Broad nudged his lenses back up his nose, back into that little groove. To see where this is going before we get there and find out we really didn't want to get there. He winced. That had come out all wrong. Wished he was better with words, but being honest, Words alone rarely got this kind of job done. Malmer had been a good talker. Look where he'd ended up. What I'm trying to say... Master Broad? He turned, surprised. There was a single light burning in the office, built up on columns at the back of the warehouse. A figure stood by the steps leading up to it. A woman's figure, tall and slight and graceful. Broad felt an ugly twist of fear in the pit of his stomach. Small women troubled him a lot more than big men these days. Just hold on, he said as he stood. He's not going anywhere, and Bannerman patted Gaunt on the side of his face and made him flinch. 
Respect, Broad strode across the warehouse floor, footsteps echoing. Not like it costs anything. It was Yuri. She looked worried, and that made him worried. She was about as hard to rattle as anyone Broad had ever met. What's wrong? he asked. She nodded up the steps towards the office. Lady Savine is here. She's here now. She wants to watch you work. That sat there for a moment between them in the darkness. Doing it was one thing. He could tell himself he had to. Choosing to watch it was another. Perhaps you could persuade her not to? Broad winced. If I could persuade people just by talking, I wouldn't have to persuade them the other way. My scripture teacher used to say that those who strive and fail are as blessed as those who succeed. That ain't been my experience. Trying cannot hurt. That ain't been my experience either, muttered Broad, following her up the steps. From the door, Savine looked her usual, perfectly controlled self. Close up in the lamplight, he could tell something was wrong. There was a sore pinkness around the rims of her nostrils, an eager brightness to her eyes, a strand of hair stray from her wig. Then he spotted the streak of faint stains on her jacket, as shocking as no clothes at all might have been on someone else. Lady Savine, he said, sure you want to be here for this. Your concern is ever so sweet, but I have a strong stomach. I don't doubt it. I'm not thinking of you. He dropped his voice. Truth is, you bring out the worst in me. Your problem, Master Broad, is you confuse your best with your worst. I need work to continue on the canal first thing tomorrow. First thing. I need it open and making me money. She snarled the last word, teeth bared, her fury setting his heart thumping. She was a head shorter than him. He'd have been shocked if she was half his weight. But she still scared him. Not because of what she might do, because of what she might get him to do. Now make it happen. There's a darling. Broad glanced over at Zuri, her black eyes gleaming in the darkness. We all are fingers on God's hand, she murmured with a sorry shrug. He looked down at his own hand, knuckles aching as he slowly curled it into a fist. If you say so. Broad strode back across the warehouse floor, footsteps echoing towards that pool of light. He told himself he was trying to look eager, to act the part, but he'd never been much of an actor. The truth was, he couldn't wait to get there. Gaunt saw something in Broad's eye, maybe. He twisted in his chair, like he could twist away from what was coming. But neither of them could. Now, where to— Broad's tattooed fist thudded into his ribs. The chair rocked back, and Bannerman caught it, shoved it forward again. Broad's other fist sank into Gaunt's other side and twisted him, eyes bulging. He stayed like that, quivering, face turning purple for a moment. He got one little wheezing breath in before he puked. It spattered in his lap, spattered the warehouse floor, and Bannerman stepped back, frowning down at his shiny new boots. Oh, we got a gusher. Took an effort not to keep punching. Took an effort for Broad to keep some kind of grip on himself and speak. When he did, it was strange how calm his voice sounded. Time's up on the civilized approach. Bring him out. Halder came from the darkness, dragging someone with him. A young lad roped up, gurgling into a gag. No, croaked Gaunt as Halder shoved the lad down and Bannerman started tying him to a chair. Oh, no, a string of drool still hanging from the corner of his mouth. A man can take a lot. When he thinks he's fighting the good fight, I know that. Broad rubbed gently at his knuckles. But seeing it done to your child, that's something else. The lad stared around, tears tracking his face. 
Broad wished he could have a drink. He could almost taste it on his tongue. A drink made everything easier. Easier at the time, anyway. Harder afterwards. He pushed the thought away. Doubt I'll be boasting about this, either. Broad checked his sleeves were rolled up right. That seemed important for some reason. But when you toss it into all the other shit I done, it hardly even shifts the level. He glanced up towards the office. Maybe he'd been hoping Savine would be waving at him to stop. But there was no one there, just the light to say she was watching. A man has to be able to stop himself. Broad had never been any good at that. He turned back. I'd like to get home. He took his lenses off, tucked them into his shirt pocket, and the lamplit faces all turned to smudges. But we've got all night if we need it. The lad's fear and Gaunt's horror and Bannerman's carelessness made muddy blurs Broad could hardly tell one from another. I need you to imagine the state you two will be in by then. The lad's chair squealed on the warehouse floor as Broad shifted it to just the spot he wanted it. Dare say you'll both be making that noise soon. Tweaked his sleeves one more time. Routine, routine, routine. The one hell makes. Broad knew how he'd have felt if he'd been tied helpless in one chair and May in the other. That was why he was pretty sure it'd work. There'll be no strike! gasped Gaunt. There'll be no strike! Broad straightened up, blinking. Oh, that's good news. Didn't feel like good news. Deep down inside, it felt like quite the disappointment. It was an effort to make his fists unclench, an effort to take the lenses from his shirt pocket, hook them back over his ears, too delicate for his aching fingers. Your son will stay with us, though just to make sure you don't have a change of heart. The lad wriggled as Bannerman dragged him back across the warehouse floor into the darkness. Respect, called Broad, carefully rolling his sleeves down. Important to have a routine. The Art of Compromise Precision, you dolts! Filio leapt from his bench to yell at the two swordsmen, their steels drooping as they gaped at him. Speed is nothing but faff and bluster without precision. He was in his late fifties, but quick and handsome still. Vic might have had more grey in her hair than he did. He dropped back beside her, muttering a few more Styrian curses under his breath before switching to common. Young men these days, eh? They expect the world served to them with golden cutlery. Vic glanced over at Tallow. He looked like he might never have seen cutlery, let alone been served with the golden kind. Even dressed smartly in practicals black, he reminded her of her brother. That apologetic hunching of the shoulders, as if he was always expecting a slap. Some have to handle hardship, she said. A little hardship would do my nephew no harm. Filio shook his head as he watched the swordsman shuffle about the training circle, boards polished smooth by generations of soft fencing shoes. He has fast hands, good instincts, but so much to learn. He groaned at a wayward lunge. I hope he might represent our city in the contest in Adua one day, but talent is useless without discipline. He leapt up again. Come on, you donkey, think about it. You competed in the contest yourself. Filio gave her a sly grin as he sank back down. Have you been checking up on me? You lost to the future King Giselle in the semi-final. Took him to a last touch, as I recall. You were there? You can't have been ten years old. Eight. A good liar sticks to the truth whenever possible. She had been eight when their bout took place, but she'd been huddled in the blackness of a stinking ship's hold, shackled to a great chain with her family and a few score other convicts. 
all on their way to the prison camps of Angland from which only she would return. She doubted that memory would have brought quite the same delight from Filio, though, his eyes shining at the memory of past glories. People are rarely made happy by all the truth. The cheering crowd, the scrape of steel, the circle laid out before the grandest buildings of the Agriont, the proudest day of my life. He was a man who admired the pomp and structure of the Union, a man who appreciated precision and discipline. That was why Vic had worn the full-dress uniform of an Inquisitor exempt, boots buffed to a mirror gleam, hair parted with a ruler and ruthlessly bound back. Filio waved towards the flashing blades. So you are a devotee of the beautiful science? Who isn't? Though in fact she wasn't. And I suppose you have come to gather votes. His Majesty is extremely keen that Westport remain where it belongs, in the Union. Or his eminence is murmured Filio, eyes never leaving the swordsmen as they jabbed and parried. And who else have you spoken to? You are my first call. He was the fourth, but in Vic's experience you had to take care with the pride of moderately powerful men. They bruised much more easily than the truly mighty. Superior Lawson spoke of you in glowing terms, a senior alderman well respected on all sides. Someone who could be a unifying voice. I'm flattered, of course, but the superior is too kind. If unity was simply a matter of the right voice, Westport might not be so terribly disunited. Perhaps we can help bring your city together. I know you believe in the Union. I do. I have all my life. My grandfather was one of those who brought us in to begin with. Filio's smile faded. But there are difficulties. King Jezal was a known quantity, but King Orso is young. Filio winced as his nephew gave a showy flourish of his steels, and has, by reputation, a surfeit of all the young man's faults. Your bungling in the wars against Styria was far from helpful. And then we have Solomio Shudra. Filio clicked his tongue. Have you heard him speak? Briefly. So persuasive, so compelling, so very, what's that word, charismatic, loved as only politicians free from power and therefore from disappointment ever can be. He's brought a lot of people around to his way of seeing things. The Union side have no one in his class, all rather stodgy. But then it's difficult, isn't it, to make a passionate argument for what you already have? So boring, whereas the delightful alternative? A bouquet of promises, a sack full of dreams, a glorious ship of fantasies, undamaged by collision with actually getting anything done. So His Majesty can count on you to vote the right way? I wish I could give you an uncompromising union, yes. But I fear for now. Filio scrunched up his face with distaste. I can only go so far as the traditional Styrian, perhaps. Here in Westport, at the crossroads of the world, balanced between the Gurkish and the Styrians and the Union, we have been obliged to make an art of compromise. I have not lasted so long in the politics of the city by sticking too closely to any one set of principles. Principles are like clothes, said Vic, straightening her jacket. You have to change them to suit the audience. Precisely so. In due course, perhaps we can discuss my price for wearing one set of colors or the other. But it would be folly to pick a side too early. I might put myself on the losing one. Vic supposed she could hardly blame the man. If she'd learned one thing in the camps, after all, it was that you stand with the winners. Then we should talk again, as the future takes shape. Vic stood, ignoring a sudden twinge through her bad hip, snapped her heels together, and gave a stiff bow. Filio looked rather pleased with it, but not pleased enough to promise his vote.
I hope so. But let us not waste each other's time until we are sure of our arithmetic. Ah! He sprang up as his nephew's heels scuffed the edge of the circle. Watch your back foot, you fool! Precision! A rare breeze washed through Westport's public gardens, smelling of resin, flowers, and spice from the market over the wall. It made a hundred varieties of foliage flap, rustle, and whisper. It flung a cloud of spray from the fountain in which the bright spring sun made a short-lived rainbow. Then a shadow fell across Vic. Met a seat? A broad-shouldered woman stood over her, dressed in loose linens in the southern fashion. Dark-skinned, strong-featured, with a fuzz of clipped grey-black hair. I'm afraid I don't speak Styrian said Vic in common. Half a lie. She could make herself understood, but might not catch every nuance, and in negotiations as delicate as these she couldn't risk a mistake. That, and she preferred to be underestimated. The woman sighed. How typical of the Union authorities to send a negotiator who cannot even speak the language. I thought this was the crossroads of the world, where all tongues are spoken. You must be Diep Mazolia. And you must be Victorine Dan Teufel. I have that misfortune. Vic had reckoned the aristocratic overtones of her full name, however awkwardly it fit her now, would suit this meeting best. Mazolia was said to be a hard-headed woman of business, so Vic had chosen to present herself as a practical Aduan lady on a trip abroad. Hair neatly braided, coiled and pinned top button left undone for a hint of relaxed approachability. It had been a while since she wore a skirt, and she felt no more comfortable in it than she did in her name. But then, feeling comfortable is a luxury spies are better off without. "'How do you like the public gardens?' asked Mazolia. "'Beautiful, if a little thirsty. They were a gift to the city from a childless heiress to a vast merchant fortune. Mazolia took her time arranging her long body on the bench. She travelled the circle of the world, hoping to gather one of every kind of tree that God has made. She waved towards a towering fir, its lower branches entirely bare, its upper ones still clinging to a few dry needles. Sadly, not everything flourishes in our climate and she glanced at Tallow, wilting in servant's livery, blotchy face beaded with sweat. It had been a bad idea to bring him. Vic knew she was better off alone. A lesson learned fresh in the camps, with every family member gone in the frozen ground. Her father, shivering, lips turned blue, shortened fingers turned black. Her mother, always asking what she'd done to deserve this as though deserve had anything to do with it. All the sweat and pain it had taken to get that medicine for her sister, turning up with the bottle gripped tight to find her stiff and cold under the threadbare blankets, her brother still holding her hand. Only the two of them left, Vic and her brother, his big sad eyes just like Tallow's. You'll never hold up someone who can't swim for themselves. In the end, they'll drag you down with them. Mazolia sighed, stretching one arm across the back of the bench. But I dare say you have not crossed the Circle Sea to discuss trees. No, to discuss the forthcoming vote. People here talk of little else, a momentous decision, but not one that you and I can take any part in, Women cannot be older men after all, Vic snorted. Women might not sit in the assembly, but they can still control the men who do. You have at least five votes in your pocket. Mazolia shrugged her heavy shoulders. Six, possibly seven. I wonder if you might be persuaded to cast them for the union. I might be, but not easily. I had one grandparent from Yashtavit one from Sikur, a third from Austria, and a fourth from the Old Empire. I am welcome, or perhaps 
equally unwelcome at five different temples in the city. I sometimes forget which version of God I am supposed to be praying to. In other nations, I would be called a mongrel. In this mongrel city, I am the norm. She smiled out at the yellow lawns where people of every shape and colour walked, sat, chatted in the shade of every strange and wonderful tree God had made. A merchant in fabrics cannot afford to take a narrow view. My business stretches across the circle of the world. Suljuk silks and Gurkish linens, imperial cottons and woolens from the north. Not to mention all those fine new textiles spooling from the mills of the Union. Not to mention those. It would be a shame for a merchant in fabrics to be cut off from the largest market in the world. There would be frustrations, of course, but like water, commerce always works through the cracks in time and becoming a part of Styria would offer its own opportunities. I understand the Serpent of Talons can be a domineering mistress. Mazolia's turn to snort. As several Union generals have discovered to their cost, but when people are willing to compromise, she can be reasonable. Look how the citizens of Talins have prospered under her rule, and I rather like the idea of a woman in charge, don't you? even a domineering one. We women really should do everything we can to work together. Or should we do exactly what the men do, and put sentiment to the side and follow the greatest prophet? Mazolia smiled ever so slightly. Fancy that. You speak Styrian after all. I hope his eminence sent an unsentimental sum of money along with you. Something better. Vic flicked open the letter and held it out between two fingers. The signature of Archlector Glockter lurked at the bottom, the lethal punchline. Trade rights once controlled by the Guild of Mercers, managed by His Majesty's Inquisition for these last thirty years. His Eminence is prepared to cut you in quite handsomely. Mazolia took the letter and weighed every word. Vic didn't rush her. She closed her eyes and tipped her face towards the sun, breathed in the perfumed air. So rare she had a moment to just sit. A nice, neat bribe, Mazolia lowered the letter. Well judged. I understand that here in Westport you like to be honest about your corruption. I take it all back. You are positively fluent. Mazolia rocked her weight forward and stood, casting Vic into shadow again. I shall consider your offer. Don't take too long. We women really should do everything we can to work together. Vic nudged the over-heavy drapes aside to peer into the street. The sun was setting on a largely wasted day, a muddy flare above the maze of mismatched rooftops, the thirsty treetops, the puffing chimneys, the spires of a hundred temples to a dozen versions of the Almighty. She wondered if it helped to believe in God, whether it was reassuring or terrifying to look at all this shit and know for sure it was part of some grand plan. Vic pressed her thumb into her aching hip as she watched the candles being lit at some thondish shrine, the lights twinkling in the windows, the bobbing torches of guides who led foreigners to Westport's best hostelries, best eateries, best back-alley muggings. The low murmur of voices passed the door, a coquettish giggle tinkling off down the hallway. Tallow frowned around the room. It was an idiot's idea of how a palace might be decorated, all velvet and peeling gilt. What kind of arsehole arranges to meet in a brothel? One who likes whores and making people uncomfortable, said Vic. Sanders Rosimish, by all accounts, loved both. A strutting loudmouth, but one who'd voiced support for the Union in the past, and a vote was a vote. People often say that bullies should be stood up to, but Vic usually found it more productive to let them bully her. 
That was why she'd made a rare visit to a dressmaker in the hope of looking as feminine and yielding as possible, hair down and combed with oil in the Westport style. She'd even worn perfume, fate's helper. The one thing she'd refused was high shoes. In her line of work, you never knew when you might have to run for your life or kick someone in the face. Fuck these things, she grunted, hooking a finger into her corset and trying vainly to wriggle into a comfortable position. Despite being made to measure, it fit her incredibly badly. Or perhaps it was cut to fit the woman people would like her to be, not the one she was. She wondered what Sybilt would have said if he'd seen her dressed like this. I wish I'd met you sooner, maybe. Things might have been different. And she'd have said, You didn't, and they're not. And he'd have given her that weary smile of his and said, You're a hard case, Vic. And he'd have been right. She caught herself missing him at the oddest times, missing the warmth of him, the weight of him in her arms, the weight of his arms around her, missing having someone she could touch. But Sybilt cut his own throat when she betrayed him. Thinking about what he might have done was a waste of time. She let the drapes fall and turned back into the room, caught Tallow frowning at her, as if at a puzzle he couldn't quite find the answer to. Do you have to keep staring? she snapped. Sorry. And he shrank back like a puppy got a kick. It's just you look... Absurd? Different, I guess. Don't forget it's the same woman underneath, the one who's got your sister for a hostage. Not likely to forget that, am I? He snapped, a hint of sullen, useless anger showing. Even that reminded her of her brother the look he used to have when he told her they had to help people, and she told him they had to help themselves. That wounded righteousness. Why are you even here? You know why. The Union's weak, enemies everywhere. If we can't hold on to what we already have, I'm asking why you care a shit. Sent you to the camps, didn't they? If I was you, I'd laugh while the Union sunk in the fucking sea. Why are you here? Her mouth twisted to spit the answer. Because she owed a debt to his eminence. Because blackmail and betrayal was the only profession she'd ever excelled at. Because you stand with the winners. She had half a dozen answers to hand. It was just that none of them were any good. Truth was, she could have done anything run off to the far country like she and Sybil had always joked about. But the moment his eminence said Westport, she'd started packing. She was still standing there, mouth half open, but nothing quite coming out, when the door swung wide and Rossumish strode in. He hadn't made quite the effort that she had. He wore a dressing gown, left carelessly open to the waist, and apparently nothing else a slice of hairy belly and chest on display. Sorry to keep you waiting, he blustered, not sounding sorry at all. She forced out a smile. No need to apologize. I know you are a busy man. You're right. I was busy fucking. Keeping that smile was an effort. Congratulations. I would like to get back to it, so let us be brief. Westport will be joining Styria. We share a coastline and a culture. One cannot argue with geography and history. I intend no disrespect. A phrase people only use when they intend as much as possible. Disrespect doesn't bother me, she said, giving her voice the slightest edge. But it might bother the arch-lector. There was a time when men would soil themselves at the mere mention of the cripple. Rossumish sneered over at her as he poured himself a glass of wine. But the serpent of Talins is the power in Styria now. Makato has bound Styria together, while the Union splits at the seams. Nobility and government at each other's throats. And these breakers... Disrespect didn't bother her. But that he'd rub her face in it with his brothel and his dressing gown, knowing who she worked for, that was a concern. 
seemed he was convinced the Styrian faction would win, was trying to win their favour by humiliating the Union's representative. One cannot have great growth without a little pain, said Vic. The Union's industry is the envy of the world. Westport would be cutting herself off from her rightful place in the future. I've already spoken to several like-minded... That bitch Mazzolia! Ha! <laughs> I hear Shudra already brought her back to his side. Better bribes than yours, I dare say. That's the thing about women. They think with their cunts. Anything that doesn't involve a cunt, they should have no opinion on. Fucking and babies, that's all. Don't leave out the monthly bleed, said Vic. It's a more versatile organ than men give it credit for. She rarely allowed herself the luxury of disliking a person any more than liking one. Either could be a weakness. But this bastard was testing her patience. Rossomish bristled, annoyed his ham-fisted coarseness hadn't thrown her. He swaggered over, puffed up with scorn. I hear Makato is sending Casimir Danschenk to the city. I don't jump at shadows. Perhaps I'll panic when he gets here. He may already have arrived. He leaned close so she could see the tiny specks of sweat on the bridge of his nose. They say he not only kills those he has sent for, but eats them. Damn, she regretted the dress now. She was starting to wish she'd worn a full suit of armour. I wonder what he would eat first. Your liver, maybe? He leered over at Tallow. Perhaps he would start by butchering your errand boy. And suddenly all she could think of was the look on her brother's face, so hurt and so surprised when the practicals stepped from the shadows. Rossomish gave a little hoot of shock as Vic's fist smashed into his face. She'd had her brass knuckles hidden behind her, but they were on her fist now. He clutched at the curtains as he stumbled back, blood flooding from his broken nose. She punched him in the side of the jaw with a sick crunch, and he fumbled his glass, spraying wine over both of them. Her knuckles caught him across the top of the head as he fell, tearing the curtains down with him. He hunched in a ball, gasping and spluttering, and she put her knee on his shoulder and rained down punches on any part of him she could reach. She lost count of the blows. Someone caught her arm, nearly dragged her over. Tallow, wrestling her back. You fucking kill him! Vic tore free, breathing hard. Her dress was wine-stained, her arm was blood-spotted. Her hair was tangled across her face, and she dragged it back, oil between her fingers. It wasn't a style well suited to beating a man. Rossomish whimpered, still curled in a ball. Tallow stared at him with those big, sad eyes. What you do that for? She hadn't even thought about it, hadn't weighed the risks or the consequences, hadn't even considered where to hit him or how to make sure he couldn't hit back. If he'd been a tougher man, things could have gone very badly wrong. Before you brush off his eminence, Master Rossomish, you should consider what you owe. Her voice was harsh now. Slum debt collector rather than city lady. She tossed the paper Glockter had given her onto the floor by his knees. Seven thousand scales and change to the banking house of Valent and Bulk. They don't take their friendship with the Union as lightly as you. She nudged the paper towards him with one sensible boot, and he cringed as it brushed his bare leg. His eminence has arranged for them to call in the loan. They'll take your houses. They'll take your whores. Never mind shanked. They'll have your fucking liver before they're done. Maybe some bullies need to be bullied after all. She leaned down over him, hissing the words, You'll vote our way, you understand? Vote our way, or we crush you like a tick. I'll vote your way, he blubbered, holding a trembling hand over his head. The little finger was broken sideways. I'll vote your way. 
Vic stalked off up the darkened street in a manner not at all suitable for her wine-stained dress. The ache in her clenched fist settled to a cold throbbing. The ache in her stiff hip getting steadily worse. Old injuries, a lifetime of them. Tallow hurried to catch her up. Guess you can't say you didn't ask for it. Silence. If you'd left it much longer, I might have punched him myself. Silence. I mean, he might not have noticed, but I would have punched him still. It was a mistake, growled Vic. You can't change the fact the world's full of assholes. You can only change how you deal with them. He gave her a weak grin. So you're not carved from wood after all. She winced as she worked her sore fingers. But them sure my hand isn't. Could be worse. Now folk here will know what I've never doubted. He gave her a stronger grin. That you're the wrong woman to mess with. She kept her face hard. It never ended well for the people she smiled at. Truth is, we're making no progress. Two weeks left, and we've lost more votes than we've gained. Solomeo bloody Shudra's too good at this. She rubbed absently at her bruised knuckles. We have to take him off the board. Aye, but— Tallow leaned close to whisper. You kill him, everyone will turn against us. Lawson said so. Whatever it costs, said Vic. That's what his eminence told me. Tallow had that worried look again. Easy to say for him who won't be paying. Some things never heal. I'm going to crush you like a tick, growled Leo, snapping out a jab and forcing Duran to parry. Just the sound of blades ringing made him feel better. By the dead, he'd missed the feeling of a sword in his hand. Like you crushed Stour Nightfall, Duran jabbed back and Steel scraped again. That's right, Leo darted forward, almost cried out at a horribly familiar twinge in his wounded thigh. Had to check and pretend it had been a feint, the disappointment almost sharper than the pain. Duran came on, grinning. So you'll bleed half to death, plainly be the worst fighter, and only win because I'm an arrogant fool? Antalp, Glarwood and Jin all chuckled, of course. Leo didn't. The more time passed, the less he liked the way his friends told the tale. He preferred the more flattering story he'd read in a printed pamphlet the other day, where the peerless young lion had outfought Stour Nightfall, cracked a couple of jokes, then made him eat dirt in front of his uncle, all over the honour of a beautiful sorceress. In that version, there'd been no mention of his not being able to walk properly ever since. After actual fighting, sparring had always been Leo's favourite thing in the world. He tried to find the eager smile he used to wear when he was doing it, like a cat playing with a mouse. Maybe he wasn't as good with a sword as Stour Nightfall, but he'd always been a damn sight better than Durand. He meant to prove it, however much it hurt. Ha! He snapped Durand's blade one way, then the other, with a pair of fierce cuts. That was more like it. He lined up a lunge that would hurt even with a blunted blade, then gasped as his weight went onto his bad leg and it nearly folded under him. It was shamefully easy for Duran to step around his feeble thrust and slash at his exposed side. Leo twisted to parry, all off balance, gave a girlish scream as pain stabbed through his thigh, then his knee buckled and he went sprawling on the rush matting, clutching at his leg. Bloody hell! You all right? No! snarled Leo, slapping Duran's hand away. The leg's fucking worse than ever! He was sick of pain. He was sick of sympathy. He was sick of being angry. He was sick of saying sorry for being angry. Then he saw the hurt on Duran's face and struggled to get a grip on himself. I'm sorry. Always thought I could laugh off pain. But it's all the time. I wake up with it, I go to sleep with it. Getting across a room is a struggle. Leaving something upstairs is a bloody disaster. Let me help. 
Glowood reached for him like a father for a crying toddler. Get your paws off me, snapped Leo. I'm not a bloody cripple. Jin and Antalp exchanged a worried glance. Nothing says I'm crippled louder than the furious insistence that you're not, after all. Leo caught Glowood's big hand before he took it away and dragged himself up, hopping on his good leg. He stood a moment, breathing hard, then gritted his teeth and accepted the inevitable. Bring me the cane, he snapped at Durand. You know what'd make you feel better? Glowood gave Leo's shoulders a crushing squeeze, which made him feel a good deal worse. Getting back in the saddle. That's where you belong. Antaup shook a fist. Leading the men. You need a battle to lead them into, grumbled Leo. Or should I lead them round and round the Lord Governor's residence? There's always fighting in Starrickland, said Glowood. Rebels are giving Lord Governor Skull a hell of a time lately. Dare say he'd be glad of the help. And people hate the Styrians more than ever, said Antalp. I hear Westport's a real powder keg. One spark and poof. He grinned as he mimed an explosion. And the women over there. He grinned wider as he mimed a bigger one. Whitewater Gin combed worriedly at his ever-thickening beard. Can't see a fancy fight in the Serpent of Tarlins. She beat King Jazal three times, and the bitch is stronger than ever. Hardly took Stolicus himself to beat King Jazal, snapped Leo. But the man had a point. The history of reckless charges into Styria was not good. Glowood pushed out his bottom lip. If it's a weak enemy you're after, I hear the Gurkish are obliging. The Empire's broken into splinters, no profit. Priests and princes and chiefs and governors all fighting each other for control. Like the North in the bad old days, said Jin. The dogman's stirring stories had all happened in the North in the bad old days. That was when names like Bethod and Black Dow and the Bloody Nine were made. Names to stir the blood. Is that so? muttered Leo, clenching his fists. Antalp's brows were very high. The Onion's got every claim on Dagoska. Leo raised his to match. That city should be ours. The four of them glanced at each other, teetering between joking and serious. Can't deny the weather's good down there. Jin patted Leo's face with one big paw. Get some colour back in those cheeks. Leo shoved the Northman's hand away, but the idea had hold of him. Just the thought of being back on campaign was making his leg hurt less. Reclaiming Dagoska for the Union? Imagine the pamphlets they'd print of that story. They'd have to give him another triumph, and with a better reward than some gaudy sword this time around. Duran, how would we get soldiers down there, do you think? He was somewhat put out to find his oldest friend staring at him horrified. Tell me you're joking. What? Duran glared at the others, and like mischievous schoolboys caught out by the headmaster, one by one they were forced into sheepish submission. He hasn't even healed from the last duel to the death, and you're falling over yourselves to talk him into another? You sound like my bloody mother, snapped Leo. Someone has to. It was bad enough when you were just the young lion. You're the Lord Governor of Angland now. You have a province full of people counting on you. You can't go charging off to any fight that'll have you because you're fucking bored. Leo stood a moment, teeth bared, ready to fight. Then he sagged. He couldn't stay angry with Durand for longer than a breath or two. You're right, you bastard. He's always right, said Glarwood sadly. He is the clever one, said Antalp, flicking back his dark forelock. Sanity prevails. Duran slapped the cane into Leo's hand and strode off, shaking his head. Shame, though, muttered Jin. Aye, said Leo. Shame. We have received a letter from His Majesty, from his closed council, you mean, grumbled Lord Mustard, or from old Sticks and his cronies.
grumbled Lord Clencher. They were quite the pair of old grumblers, those two. They could have won grumbling contests, which was pretty much what these meetings came down to. Leo's mother cleared her throat. They ask us to raise an extra hundred thousand marks in taxes. Again? Leo's voice went shrill with dismay, while the worthies around the table shook their grey heads. The ones who weren't entirely bald, at least. They shook bald heads. They say, since we have peace in the North, revenues should rise, and Angland will not need so large an army. We have peace because we have an army. Leo tried to leap up, winced at a stab through his leg, and had to sink back, clenching his teeth, clenching his fists, clenching everything. What about the cost of the war? Are they paying that at least? Leo's mother cleared her throat again. They do not mention it. Are we the king's subjects or his bloody livestock? snapped Mustard. This is unacceptable. Disgraceful! growled Clencher. Outrageous! What the shit? Leo smashed at the table with a fist and made the papers and most of the old men jump. The bloody arrogance of the bastards! In war, all they sent were good wishes, and in peace, all they sent are demands. I swear they'd ask for my fruits in a bag if they thought they could get a good price for the damn things. My lords, Leo's mother turned smiling to the room. Do you suppose you could give us the chamber for a moment? With tired voices and tired legs, the old lords of Angland shuffled to the door. They could hardly have looked more tired than Leo felt. As Lord Governor, he was buried in responsibilities. If he didn't spend four hours a day at his desk, he'd drown in paperwork. He hardly knew how his mother had done it. No small part of him wished she was still doing it. We support you, Lord Brock. Mustard's moustaches vibrated with loyalty as he paused in the doorway. We support you, whatever. Clencher's jowls trembled as he nodded agreement. Damn those bastards on the closed council! And he pulled the doors shut. The gloomy room was silent for a moment as Leo's anger drained away and he worked up the courage to look at his mother. To see that slightly disappointed, slightly exasperated, slightly resigned look she'd been perfecting ever since he could remember. Another bloody lecture? Just an entreaty, Leo. She took his hand, squeezed it in hers. I share your annoyance, really I do. But you're Lord Governor now, you have to be patient. How can I? He couldn't bear to sit a moment longer. He twisted his hand free and struggled up, half-hopped to the narrow windows and wrestled one open, desperate to feel fresh air on his face. He looked out across the rain-shiny roofs of Ostenholm towards the grey sea, rubbing at his sore leg. Are you sure I'm cut out for this, managing petty complaints? I'm happier at war than at peace. Your father was just the same. But being Lord Governor is about managing the peace. The Closed Council know Nightfall respects you. The Great Wolf only respects the boot across his neck. To disarm us? How can they be so blind? It's not half a year since we were fighting for our lives without a shred of help from those bastards. I know. But if you're furious whenever the Closed Council does something infuriating, you'll be furious all the time. Rare anger can be inspiring. Frequent anger becomes contemptible. Leo took a breath, forced his shoulders down. By the dead, he was always angry these days. You're right. I know you're right. The wind was chill outside. He dragged the window closed, gripped his thigh, and took a few hobbling steps back to his chair, his prison, and dropped down into it. Perhaps you should stop training she said softly. Rest the leg. I did rest it, and it hurt more, so I trained, and it got worse, so I rested it again, and that didn't help. Nothing bloody helps. I'm trapped by the fucking thing. A change of scene might do you good. We've been invited to Lord Isha's wedding. A trip to Adjua would present many opportunities. To kiss the king's ass. 
to make your case to him. You said he was a reasonable man. Leo scowled. He hated when his mother talked sense. It made it damn difficult to fight with her without talking nonsense himself. She and Durand had him in a relentless bloody pincer movement of rationality. I suppose so, he grumbled. Then reason with him. Build some friendships on the open council. Make some allies among the closed. Use their rivalries to your advantage. You can be charming, Leo, when you want to be. Charm them. He couldn't help smiling. Could you just for once be wrong, mother? I've tried it a couple of times. It really didn't suit me. By the dead, it stinks, said Leo, face crushed up with pain and disgust as the bandages peeled sticky from his thigh. An odour is entirely natural, your grace. The surgeon nudged his eye lenses back up his nose with his wrist. You'd have thought a man who had to wear lenses but use his hands would at least find a pair that weren't constantly sliding down his nose, but in this, as in so much else, it seemed Leo would be disappointed. Some corruption has found its way into the wound. Corruption? How? Some injuries simply become corrupt. Like everything bloody else, hissed Leo, as the man probed at the wound with his thumbs and made it weep a thick yellow tear. It looked like a red eye, lids stubbornly pressed shut in a refusal to see the truth. I've seen men make complete recoveries from the most terrible injuries, mused the surgeon as if they were discussing a scientific curiosity rather than Leo's life, but I've seen men die from a thorn prick. Very reassuring. How long ago was it inflicted? Five months, grunted Leo through gritted teeth. No, six. Ah! And from a sword? The same time and the same sword as these others. Leo waved at the scar on his face, faded to a pale line. The one on his side, the one on his shoulder. But they all healed. This one seems to be getting worse. We'll have to drain it. That should ease the pain. Whatever you have to do, whispered Leo, wiping the tears from his cheek on the back of his arm. You sure you wouldn't like husk for the— No! Leo remembered his father at the end, raving and drooling. No, I need to stay sharp. Though what for? So he could watch his friends train from a chair, sit through endless meetings about tax— he should take husk for the pain of that rubbish. The surgeon offered a strip of leather to bite on. You might want to look away, Your Grace. I think I will. Flashing steel used to delight him. Now the glint of the sun on the tiny blade was making him feel faint. He was the young lion, no man braver. Riding into a line of spears had been nothing. Now... Even the idea of moving the leg, touching the...